Second Kings, the um, fourth chapter, verse one through seven. I'm going to pick it up out of the New King James uh, reading. New King James reading. Um, give me just one second. I'm touching my glasses. Okay, you have it. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried out to Elisha, saying, "Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he, he that, that and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditors have come to take my sons, and to be to be their slaves." So Elijah said to her, "What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house?" And she said, "Your main servant has your maid servant." has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And King James says a pot of oil. Verse 3, And then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour it into all of those vessels and set aside the full ones. Verse 5, so she went from him, shut the door behind her. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to the, her sons, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is no more, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Verse 7, then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go and sell the oil and pay the debt, and you and your sons shall live on the rest. I want to work this subject with so many subjects in it. I like live on the rest, but we're going to work down through it. The subject is simple. There's a miracle in your house. There's a miracle in your house. Uh, Henry, I need you to come and clean these, please. I don't know what I did, but they're, they're blearing all up. Look at somebody said, there's a miracle in your house. Okay. This lesson is one of faith and obedience in this miracle that is happening and that has taken, is going to take place. A miracle is a surprising and welcoming event, especially in, when, it, when it overrides science and laws. Therefore, it is considered to be the work of the divine agent. It's a God thing. Someone said that, well, I don't want to ever have to have a miracle. I don't need to have to have a miracle. Um, you never know when you're gonna need a miracle. So believe in them, even if you don't feel you need one. Because there's certain things that will happen in your life, you will attest, now God did that. I don't care how I, how I did it, how I set it up, that was a God thing there. That was a miracle. I was talking to a, a, a um, Alpha and a Gen Z, um, that's the younger generation, the millennials, they said that, well, we don't see miracles anymore. God's not parting Red Seas. I said, well, how did you get to work? And how did you make it back home? You take it so for granted that that little yellow line in the middle of the road gonna keep that car over there. It's a miracle. Every time you drive past a car, you should say miracle, 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 miracle. Because you don't know if that person, God forbid, could go into some type of attack a seizure, or anything. Something is keeping you in that miracle place, miracle, divine agent of God. I believe God is still working miracles today. According to Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Say that, Jesus Christ. The same today, yesterday, and forever. Just showing you the miracles of God is in the past, is in the present, and is also in the future. I can't keep living on Big Mama's miracles and testimonies. I have to live on my own now to know God has come through and he's been a miracle worker in my life. 
First John, the Bible says in 5, 1 John 5 and 14, whatsoever you ask, any, whenever you ask anything according to my will, I will do it. Will God perform a miracle today? Yes. If I ask it according to his will, he will do it. The prophet here of this widow woman had died. She's now in a dire extreme. But thank God, the man of God can tell her that even if you're in a dire extreme, man's extremities are God's opportunities. You might be at the end of it all, and that's what God picks up, because you are going to be the recipient of a miracle. She needed a miracle, a divine turnaround from God, favor that did not merit it, but God stepped in and gave it to her. There's a miracle in your house. Say that. There's a miracle in my house. The prophet Elijah was passing by this woman's house or her dwelling, humble dwelling place in verse 1 of First Kings, 2 Kings 4 and 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried out to him. Now, if you would study at another time, but I'm just going to break it down from what I got from it. This cry is not, hey, I need some help. Could, uh, could you please come by and help me? No. no, this cry was one of those loud, squeaking noise that would just make your ears pop. The extremity in her voice brought that cry out where it was very audible and very disturbing. And she cried because he was about to pass her house. A high pitch, a high pitch, I'm sorry. This high pitch of the sounds of these words was especially terrifying to the ears. Pain was hitting this man's head, but he realized this woman was crying out to him, hey, I need some help. I don't need you to pass by today. Elijah's name means God is salvation. So this miracle is a deed of mercy, suggesting that of Jesus of Nazareth, which was a deliverer to many. She cried. She cried. I need you just for a moment to put in the atmosphere glory. glory. Your neighbors sound louder than you. Just put in the atmosphere one more time. Your neighbors sound louder than you. You got to scream louder than your labor, neighbor one more time. Say glory. glory. Your neighbor is still out screaming you. But to collectively, it sounds like one voice. But spiritually, someone else is saying glory from another level. Someone else is calling Jesus from another level. It happens all the time. You can be in any type of a movement of a service, and somebody else could be more intense than you are. Who's going to love me most? Them I've forgiven most. So my hallelujah and glory doesn't sound like yours because you don't know what I'm going through right now. So I can say glory from a depth that will make you scoot over and wonder what's going on. Because when demons are fighting your family and your life and your mind and your peace, you're not going to glory. Jesus. Hallelujah. Even though he can hear a still small voice, but this poor man cried. And the Lord heard and delivered from all fears. She was crying out to the man of God because she found herself penniless, unable to meet the demands of the creditors, to pay the bills from the debt her husband had left her. Isn't that something? This debt was not reckless, not something that he did purposefully. Just sometimes you get caught up in working on the wrong thing, and don't handle your business. He was a prophet. Prophets are strange birds. Everything is mystical to them, and they have deep insight to things. Prophets can begin to speak things and never have anything to back it up. They just flow in the prophetic. They see it, they speak it. I was in Trinidad a few weeks ago, and this prophet was there after three hours of service so we're Westerners, so get it done. Let's go. Well, he was prophesying and was speaking very, just emphatically, just very profoundly. This lady came up. She says, he says, I, I want you to know that um, you need to call your sister. She says, well, I don't have her number. He said, it's in your phone. She said, well, I don't know where it is. And he gave her the phone number and said, call it. 
She dialed the number, and it was her. I said, wow, I don't just see nothing else until I leave. Because <laughs> you see, another lady came up, he says, your bank account number is XYZ123, and he gave her the whole bank account number. I said, that's good, but if you put some money in there, it might be better. <laughs> Prophets are a gift, and they can see things, they can speak things, they, and, and, and they have great depth, but sometimes they can get caught up and miss the move and the purpose of God. This woman's husband was a prophet is what I'm trying to say. And no doubt he was studying in school and trying to do his thing and be run with the school of prophets and all of a sudden he got sick and he died prematurely. Left the woman and this, with her two sons and she at the hands of the dead. Hmm. She was dependent on him to take care of her. She dependent on him to take care of her and her sons. But he's got so busy that he just lost track of that. Not prepared, you'll be prepared after a while because something will meet you if you're not prepared. He upped and he died. Leaving her with the dead. Second Kings 4th chapter verse 1. She was responsible for the dead but the creditors came and began to threaten her. Miracle in your house. Come on Clinton, move a little faster. He says, to the point that the law allowed them to come and threaten her according to Leviticus 25 and verse 40, that if you owed a person and you could not pay them, you became their servant or slave. Not as a slave, as a foreigner, but as a slave to work off the debt. But at the year of Jubilee, you had to be released and go back to your own home. So they threatened her because they had right to come after her. Dire in need, being threatened, the creditors were coming. But she cried to Elisha, the prophet, and through that cry for help, he began to give her conversation and attention. Realizing that she needed relief and release from this, he asked her in, I think, the second verse, or in the first verse there, the second verse, I'm sorry, of 2 Kings 4 and 2, the miracles in your house. It's not for, for a way. This is not a, a fairy tale story. This is a true event. The miracle is in the house. Looking at this responsibility, Elijah questions her in 2 Kings 4 and 2, woman, what do you have in your house? I think this was a prophetic question for him to awaken her to come out of what she was going through, to start focusing back on what she had. She said, your maid servants have nothing in the house but a jar or a little pot of oil. In other words, I don't care how bad it looks, you got something to work with. If you didn't have nothing to work with, you wouldn't be here working on nothing. But could always leave a little something for you to work with to let you know it ain't over yet. Like somebody say, it ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. And I'll know when it's over, I have nothing to work with. All the woman had was a small quantity of cruise of oil, perhaps a little small thing that you would use for after you've bathed using that little bottle of oil. But little is much when you put it in God's hand. That little becomes a whole lot more than what you're thinking when you put it in God's hand. I'm in this unwanted position. Debt and creditors are at the door. But God, I got a little oil. And God says, I'm gonna do this miracle. One, for you, the lady. Two, for your sons. And three, for the prophet. Because the prophet is the one speaking to me about God's getting ready to change my story into something better. Miracle in your house. There is a miracle in my house. A little in the prophet's hand was enough for him to test her faith. What if she would have said, there's nothing in my house, not anything. I have nothing at all. God can work from nothing, but he also can work with something. But her faith says, I got a little bit a seed. I don't have a big offering, but I have a little offering. I don't have a big faith, but I got a little faith. I don't have a big prayer, but I got a little prayer. And God will take and exceedingly do abundantly above all you ever ask or think with your little. I want to think that the prophet was speaking to her faith and her, not her dire extreme, nor the threats. Remember, the creditors have come, they're at the door, they're about to take my sons away. He says, what have I to do with you, woman? Uh, what's in your house? Oh, uh, let me stay another way. He was not concerned about the creditors, nor the threat that was at her door. 
nor the, the, the dire strait her sons are going to be in. I want to know where's your faith and what do you have left in your house? Whatever you believe, I believe. Whatever you believe becomes true. Whatever you focus your attention and your energy on becomes your reality. Your, if you're thinking, to, you're talking to something, some, you're talking to yourself about people don't like me, people that are, are not my friends, I'm by myself, I don't have anybody, everybody's judging me, then that's the reality that you live with. Because what you say becomes your reality. Ask me, say it another way. Good. Numbers of 13 chapter verse 33. When the spies went into the land, they knew the giants were in the land before they went there. Numbers 13 and 33. But they got down there and the other spies gave a bad report and said there are giants in the land. I told you before you went down there, there was giants in the land. God never sends you to take territory where there are no giants. He wants you to let the enemy know, I know that it looks like you're the one that's going to defeat me, but God sent me to defeat you. And when they got down there in Numbers 30, 13 and 33, the Bible says we, the spies, that brought back the evil report. He said, we saw the giants and the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sights. Whenever I read this, this scripture in, in Numbers 13, 33, Reverend Ray, I'm wondering, um, how were they able to come back and tell the story that we saw the giants? when the giants are bigger than them. So if they saw the giants, wouldn't you think that the giants saw them? But God wouldn't let the giants take them out. Oh, mercy. You was talking about this big giant you've been seeing, and you're back to tell the testimony, I saw the giants, because God wouldn't let the giant take you out. Oh. <laughs> it should have destroyed you, but here you are testifying about what you saw that didn't hurt you, what you saw that didn't stop you. Because the miracle is in your house. When he took them through this and they gave this evil report in Numbers 14, the evil report, because that's the way they saw their perception, Numbers 14, 1 through 4, they began to go into that deception and in that thought of mind. What you think you become your reality. If you see yourself as a grasshopper, Numbers the 14 chapter, now they begin to murmur. Now they begin to complain. Now they begin to talk about Moses and say, we want to go back to where we came from because we can't go and defeat this, this, this land that God asked us to come into. Don't allow yourself to spiral down that staircase that you're not going to be what God said you're going to be. Don't be that. You're not a grasshopper. You are a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. That's how you're thinking. Philippians 4 and 8, think on these things. We're going to have praise and joy. Philippians 4 and 8, think on these things. You have to think better than what you're thinking at this present time. 2 Kings 4 and 2, what's in your house is the prophet's question, 2 Kings 4 and 2. They're dressing the physical house she was living in, also her mental house. And one want to understand that you have two houses you have to deal with, the house up here and the house you live in. In, up here, you got something, as well as in your house, you have something. Other words, you don't have nothing. You have something still to work with. You still got something left. May not be much, but you still got something left, a miracle in your house. It may be a little strength. It may be a little faith. It may be a little courage, a little joy, but you still have something in your house that you can use to get the job done. Second Kings 4, verse 3. Elijah commanded her, the woman to borrow all the vessels that she could from her neighbors. Woman, listen, I need to get you industrious because you're sitting around to, to idle and you worrying too much about what you can't do nothing about. So you get up and go borrow these vessels. Get your feet moving and go up to your neighbor's house. I don't want them to know nothing about your business. Don't go over there complaining about oh me, oh my, and what you're going through. I want you to do something so ridiculous that your neighbor's going to leave, leave you away from the, leave, let you go from, go from their door pondering, why would you come and borrow an empty vessel? She says, but that's all I want you to do, woman. She said, don't worry about it. Believe me, I'm going to do something because the miracles in your house but I need some empty vessels. 
He says, I want you to get them and bring them back to your house and put them in the house. What am I doing now with an empty vessel? Well, I think it'd be like somebody giving me a blank check. It may not be filled in, but at least you can sign your name and I'll take care of the rest. But you go and get that empty vessel because it represents potential. Potentials is having or showing the capacity to develop into something in the future. I may look like I'm empty, but I'm a vessel. And I have potentials in me that can be something in the future. Because God's getting ready to pour into my life something I never thought I would be able to receive. The vessels must be empty. That's what I told you to do. And I want you to borrow them from your neighbors. So she started out, found these empty vessels. Can you see her going around, knocking on doors? I need a vessel. What do you have? Give me these empty containers. I'm going to take them back home. I've never seen a person go and get an empty vessel with not, with the, not without the expectation of something being poured into it. Have you ever seen a homeless person on the corner doing sign language? I've never seen a homeless person on the corner doing sign language. They made it very clear on their paper, this is what I want. We'll work for food, just got laid off, don't want a job, but give me a dollar. They made it very clear in their, in, on their paper what they wanted, but I've never seen anyone doing sign language. So woman, if you get these vessels, it's a sign of potentials for me to fill up what you don't have. But you need a vessel for me to fill it up. The problem with most people, you're not hungry and you're not thirsty. But if you hunger and thirsty, he'll fill you up. That you will never lack anything again in your life. I remember so clearly a young man came to me and says, I'm, I'm so disgusted, I'm so tired, uh, I'm, it's cold out here on this bus stop and, and the weather is too hot in Vegas in the summertime and, and it's raining out here. And I said, are you complaining? Let me help you complain. It's tough paying the pool man. It's tough paying the housekeeper. It's, it's tough uh, trying to keep things up. Choose the way you want to suffer. But I'm not going to allow you pull me down to where you at because I'm not going back there. There's a miracle, come on Clinton, there's a miracle in the house. Elijah stretched her faith to get something empty. Nobody else wanted it, but I'm going to show you what I can do with it. For little became much when she brought it back to the house. Faith will always outwork your works. I got to tell you that to myself. Faith will always outwork your works, but faith and work go together. You get something empty. She understood very clearly. Her neighbors were concerned about why she's getting all these vessels, but she's got them large, small of every size because the miracle was in her house. Second Kings fourth chapter, verse four, work with me. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door. Now that's my shout and run move right there. When you get what I told you to get, come in and shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all of these vessels and set aside the full ones. Elijah requested of her was so sporadic and erratic that for her to borrow empty vessels, this place of her movement was the level of her faith. When she got the vessels and came in, before the oil start pouring, and before you start praying, you have to shut the door. The actions of shutting the door is an action of involving, uh, understanding that I don't need no public propaganda. My miracle ain't for everybody. Shutting the door is a place of prayer, intercession, and personal time with God. When you shut out all that other stuff and you go in with God and watch him begin to work. Faith kicks in because you know you have a need, but you shut out everything else, all doubts and fear and all that, that unbelief and mis misbelief. It's, you shut all that out and you are trusting God because the door is shut. Let's how Jesus said in Mark, Matthew 6 and 6. But when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray 
to your father who is in secret places. Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Matthew 6 and 6. Shedding the door means that I got to get to the place where I'm shedding everything out but what God is bringing in. Shedding the door means prayer is bringing down the grace of God to my heart to supplying the needs. How big is God and how much can he feel? I'm glad you asked. Psalms 81 and 10. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Psalms 81 and 10. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. You can't ask God for enough that he can't feel. But if you don't open your mouth, you will not get nothing. So when you shut the door, you open your mouth and watch God begins to fill it. Come on, come on. Watch God begin to fill it because your mouth is opening wide. How wide? Like the woman in 1 Kings, the first cha fourth chapter, verse 1. She cried out to Elijah. When God is getting ready to do acts of faith in your life, you have to shut the door. You cannot allow yourself to be pulled back into that negative space with people that doubters and go withouters. You have to shut the door. I don't need your cheerleading. Is my house, is my vessels, and I got some oil. Because this oil that I have, I don't see in scripture. Nobody else in town had any oil, but you had empty vessels. You got something in your house that nobody else in town have. And God told me to let you know if you trust me, I can fill it up. I will blow your mind while you're watching it behind closed door. Turn around and tell somebody, shut the door, 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 shut the door. Shut the door. Everyone cannot be trivial to your miracle. Everyone cannot be trivial to your house. Everyone not can be trivial to what God is doing in your life. Don't let everybody in your house. Make sure you keep your space clear. You didn't did a whole lot of work getting all that drum up out of there. Make sure they take their shoes. No, I'm sorry, but make sure everybody does not come in your house. Somebody shut the door. 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 Second Kings, fourth chapter, I'm moving quickly, verse 6. The woman began to pour. Second Kings, fourth chapter, verse 6. She began to pour till the vessels were filled. As she poured out of her meager, her little small bottle of oil, the jars began to fill up. The fountain began to flow. The fountain only stopped because she had no more vessels. Woo! She poured what little she had. I'm pouring tonight. The vessels are being filled up. The vessels are being filled up to be rich and increase. And abundance with the abundance of God. And the only reason that the, the oil is going to stop pouring because the vessels are no more. 2 Kings 4 and 6, the sons kept placing vessels in front of the mother. She said, well, bring me some more vessels. They said, we don't have any more vessels. There's nothing else left here. He said, don't worry about it. He said, then that's all we need to do. When it told the prophet, the prophet said, sell what you have and go and pay the creditors because you got to get rid of them. I want you to know what's in your house is going to take care of the creditors and you're going to have some surplus said, I want you to live on what's left over. God is bringing you to a place where the blessing is going to be so rich, you're going to be able to pay everybody off and live on surplus. I prophesied in this house tonight, somebody's going into your surplus living. No more job to job and barely making it and trying to get ends to meet. If you do what God said, he'll put you in a surplus category. And the surplus means that you're living on the overflow. People who live on the overflow got a whole nother level of shout and a whole nother level of praise. Because they know that before this, creditors were at the door. I was in trouble, about to take my boys. But now God set me up to a time of brokenness. <laughs> till I had to trust him with empty spaces so he can fill them up. I just wanted you to know the government ain't filling this one up. I'm going to fill this up. 
and this house, everybody in this house will be filled. I need you to prophesy like you got to speak it and pour it over somebody's head. Said nobody, pour, pour your hand over somebody's head. Say nobody should, if you're at home, get a pot. Nobody should leave out of here empty. The only reason you leave out of empty because you ain't pouring. Some of y'all ain't pouring yet. I say get your spiritual spigot and pour it over somebody's head and tell them the only reason you ain't full because you don't want nothing. But you will live the rest of this year on surplus because God has promised you obeyed, did what he said, sell that gifted talent in this house. Every gift we need is in the house. It's already here. You got a Shaquille O'Neal living in your house. You got somebody that's gonna be bigger than big because they're in your house. Say, my house is blessed. My home is blessed. I am blessed. I'm not broke. I'm living on surplus.